Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you for being here yet again. So this is our second official building committee uh, for those that were here uh, about a month ago. Uh, so the goal last month was introductions, talk about the mission, uh, talk about some of the process that we've been through through the feasibility study, and then uh, creating this official building committee, and then the hiring of SMA as our official design service firm. Uh, so that's what sort of happened last month. We had, I think, some great discussion, a lot of good questions that we're going to get into and sort of follow up uh, for the agenda. Uh, but then I, I just want to, I guess I'm going to jump ahead, uh, but I just want to give a lot of props to SMA. Uh, the experience that we had through the feasibility study and now the process that we've had over the last month or so, uh, from my vantage point, is like that. Uh, and I've said this in some planning meetings that we've had, some update meetings. Uh, the ability for the feedback that has been given to SMA and then the response to that feedback has been, I think, tremendous. So I want to say publicly say thank you for that. Uh, I think we all know that we worry about the money, we worry about the budget, we'll get to that eventually. But the fact that uh, the response to feedback has been wonderful, uh, I appreciate that. So without further ado, without jumping around the agenda too much, uh, let's just go around the table, probably for Deb, probably for all of us, just introduce ourselves. Uh, again, what role you have, you know, what your background is. So, uh, I'm Andy with the superintendent. My name is Mike Gale. I'm chairman of the Board of Trustees for the school. Leonard Roberts, own Roberts Brothers and Lumber Company in Asheville, graduate here, advisor to the carpentry department. Tim Moran, MJ Moran Mechanical, and also advisory to the plumbing department. I'm John Parrott. I taught here at the front of time, James, and uh, I'm using forestry and fine soil science and I understand the energy sector reasonably well. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm Chris Alexander, I'm a student at Moore Walter. I work with my father, John Kershaw, at a Tom Berry, I'm an architect with Cubital Architects in Amherst. I am also on the Carpentry Advisory Board. Okay. Um, Helen Fantini, um, project manager So, I think the first official agenda item is to update the committee on the proposed design. And yeah, I just want to do a little quick segue. I'll turn over to Helen and team uh, that have a PowerPoint. Uh, so, we have this official building committee we've been meeting typically. I think our plan is to meet monthly, uh, probably the same Tuesday as the board of trustees meeting. So, I think it makes a lot of sense for the trustees that are on this particular committee to meet the same afternoon. Uh, there's a, a subcommittee uh, comprised of Tim, uh, Crystal, myself, uh, Joe Bianca as the principal. Uh, and we've been meeting with uh, SS, SMMA on a weekly basis, basically, via Zoom. Uh, and I'm not going to steal a thunder about the site visit that he had early on. I know we'll talk about that in a little while. But we've been meeting weekly through Zoom to talk about the, the design ideas that you saw last month, uh, get some feedback, sort of some revisions. And uh, that process has been happening weekly. We'll talk about that in more detail. I think the presentation you're going to see this afternoon, uh, SMA is going to walk us through sort of that process of revising the plan, some of the questions that we've had to tackle. Uh, so I think what you're going to see today is more refined than what you saw last month, obviously. Uh, but we are going to be looking for a lot of input from all, a lot of new things. Specifically, what I'm hoping for is some input around the site plan, physically where the building should be sat down back. On uh, today's meeting that we had earlier today, uh, there's some discussion about that. So, uh, without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Alan and Tia for a walk us through. Yeah, sure, absolutely. Thanks for the kind words. We hope never to disappoint you. Um, <laughs> oh, there we go. Great. Um, so, um, gotten through the introductions, but um, essentially, uh, this is the uh, list of topics we plan to cover with you all today. 
um, talk a bit, uh, a little bit more about the process to date um, that Amy has referred to. Um, give you an update on the plan, the building plans, um, how um, we're comparing square footage wise uh, with the early work done uh, during feasibility. Um, fortunately, today we have Berkshire Design Group here with us. Um, they've been able to jump in with both feet uh, on site planning, so they'll show you some uh, early studies there. Um, where we are in the information gathering process, uh, and then we'll touch on the schedule and the next steps. Uh, so process-wise, um, I, I think um, Amy's already mentioned, we meet weekly, but our first real weekly meeting was back on the 20th of June. Uh, we are calling that the kickoff meeting. Um, we had great input, actually a great group of students that um, James and Mark had sent over to talk to us. Had had strong opinions. Uh, it was really wonderful to interface with them. Um, also met with the working group on that day and did a, a building walkthrough and a site walk around. Um, and then since then, um, we've really been meeting on a weekly basis, taking in feedback, uh, refining the plans um, as we go, um, and you know, um, reacting to comments, um, mostly around square footage, but also around location of various parts of the building. <laughs> so we started um, really with a refinement process. When we had um, come to you and shown you the uh, plan that we had developed for the interview, we really did that in a void of information. So it was really wonderful, as Helen said, um, to be able to meet with everyone, get feedback from a whole bunch of different sources. And that really spurred uh, these four options that got developed. Uh, it was a little looser in terms of us looking at uh, relationships, uh, program spaces that were there. I think one of the primary um, aspects that we were trying to flush out or flesh out through the, um, these initial options was the location of the offices, uh, staff offices, and how those relate to both the classrooms and as well as the shop spaces. And we understood that visibility is key, um, but whether it was visibility in the classroom spaces or the shops was really the question, and that's what um, those four options really looked to um, understand. I think what we really arrived at um, hearing the feedback from these options is that having some oversight of the offices directly of the shop spaces um, was the most critical. And that's really because that's where students um, are really um, engaging in hands-on activities and where safety is paramount in terms of making sure that the oversight is there. So uh, that was good feedback and we proceeded um, to look at uh, subsequent options and developments, refinements to that um, using uh, that option four is sort of our spring point. Um, and so we came back, uh, I think this was actually two weeks later because of, it was over the 4th of July uh, holiday, uh, but we came back, we refined those options, um, and we were really looking to um, understand square footages of where everything fell, um, trying to make sure that we could uh, incorporate MEP spaces into the plan, uh, looking to understand also a little bit more about the retail program and the head house and really how those um, spaces really can function together and actually uh, have combined in terms of their footprint, in terms of how things are going to be used. Um, so as we went through these options, um, things were working themselves out in terms of adjacencies and everything started to feel good. Um, the challenge that we still faced here though is that you can see in the bottom right hand corner of each of those plans that the uh, overall footprint of the building um, was still trending a little bit higher um, than what the feasibility study plan had been looking towards. And so, as Andy has uh, reinforced to us over and over again, budget is really a critical consideration. Um, and so as we move forward in this past week and what we actually showed the group this morning, uh, we actually looked at ways of compressing the square footage while still maintaining the program pieces that were here. I have a, I have a question. Sure. When you presented last time, you talked about perhaps using some Wood, especially uh, CLT. Now, surely there are some expectations of CLT clear span lengths, and so how do those affect this design? Are you offering a, a span that's 10 inches longer than a certain uh, benchmark so that the, the wood would have to jump up uh, earth wise? I just I wondered if you had taken that into consideration yet. I think we're still sort of at the infancy of sort of that level of understanding of where we are. We have had an initial discussion with our structural engineer to really uh, understand the constraints of what's there in terms of span distances. Um, we were working initially with a 16-foot base facing in one direction and longer spacing in the 
other direction, assuming that there's going to be some type of truss work up above, um, that we'd be able to uh, handle the longer spans in a single direction. We've actually got to press that down to 14 feet um, as a sort of typical bay working across. We still think that's readily within the ability of what the CLT will offer, and that, that is still our intention. Okay, it's um, like 75 by 150, is that generally the footprint? Um, I think that was the form. I think it's actually gotten a little bit tighter overall. Um, I forget exactly what footprint we're. Uh, right, that was probably before we shrunk it by the six feet. So. Right, so we'll be, we'll be a little bit in sort of around here. We can get you the specific dimensions after just to, to help inform everybody as we move forward. But it's very much still in our minds to Choose the the use yeah. of CLT. So uh, that led us to these uh, two options that we'll show you in a little bit more detail here. And I'll run through sort of different program components because we realize that everyone is going to be able to sort of look at these in detail for the first time. Um, and we're referring to them as option 4B.1 and option 4B.2. And as I mentioned also this morning, it gets a little bit verbose in terms of what the references are, but it really it speaks to the history of them in terms of how they evolved, and so it's a good marker for us moving forward. Um, what we've done is uh, shrunk down the footprint a little bit. You can see in the bottom right hand corner, it's um, just over 10,000 square feet, 10,500 ish. Um, still 1,000 square feet over where we were in terms of the feasibility study, but um, this we felt was a good compromise in terms of coming down and bridged uh, the gap that we had there by about 50%. Um, what we were showing previously. Um, it still feels good overall. Um, if you look across the top of the plan, we're starting maybe on the upper right-hand corner, uh, you see four classroom spaces. Um, one of those is really dedicated to a horticultural drafting shop. That's where um, that activity would take place. Um, there's a simulator classroom that is right next to it. Both of those classrooms shrunk a little bit because we understood more about um, the number of students that would be in there and the activities that are going to be going on. Uh, we're still waiting on cut sheets for the actual simulators themselves to make sure that that is the right size space. So it might need to get a little bigger, it might need to get a little bit, or could get a little bit smaller potentially when we have that information, but this is going in the right direction. Um, the next two classrooms off to the left-hand side um, are more for elective purposes. Um, so those are set up with more typical uh, student desks and chairs, or tables and chairs. Um, each can accommodate 24, 25 students within. Um, so that's what be sort of the elective function in there. So you have two of those larger classrooms. Um, right to the left of that, we have a bank of student and staff toilets, as well as custodial rooms, um, MEP uh, rooms that are in there, water, electric, and data room. Um, we have included in this layout um, a student locker alcove. So rather than stringing the lockers along the hallway, and which can get um, a little chaotic um, just when students go out to actually get all of their um, their materials from the lockers, consolidating it in one spot with the locker alcove and seemed like it was a good uh, approach overall from the use of the building standpoint. We come then across the hall down directly below where those lockers are. Um, that's where the head house space and sort of retail component has been combined. Um, there is still the, the salvage desk that's in there right now that we've uh, brought over. Uh, we think we'll make a really nice sort of reception desk actually when if anyone comes in, staff comes in to purchase. Um, it's really right there, front and center, um, being such a nice piece, it makes sense. It will make a really nice um, entry field configuration there. Um, and so the head house base is right there. We're showing a couple storage rooms um, located around there just for some um, ad capacity. Um, and then if we move to the right, um, the horticultural shop is right um, in the middle. Um, it does have some overhead uh, big doors. Um, and there is a storage space that's located directly off of that, whether it's for storage or tools, it's that will get refined as we move forward with the programming. Um, we are still showing a footprint um, in there for climbing structure, and we had a lot of good discussion about the climbing structure. We know that there's a skills grant that was uh, approved uh, for that particular apparatus or some portion of it. Um, whether it gets used here at this building or whether it potentially get, gets used in an off-site location, uh, it's something that we're going to um, flesh out as we move forward. It may come to the estimate, uh, estimating process in terms of when we look at it. 
um, potentially as an alternate to see whether it fits into the overall budget pictures. It would still be a wonderful thing to incorporate into the building for a lot of reasons, but we, we again need to make sure that we respect the budgetary constraints. This is on slab, there's no basement? This potential, this, this uh, layout is assuming it's on slab with no basement. I think what uh, Rachel and Lucy will show, um, there's at least one option that has the potential of carving out some space below. Um, and we can talk a little bit more about storage as we move forward because it, there's, there's a lot of things that need to be stored. <laughs> so it's uh, something to consider whether or not that storage capacity wants to be built wholly into this building or potentially if there's an outbuilding that's associated with that or again, offsite locations. I think all those things are really, have been part of our discussions. Um, so just to the right of the workhorse shop, um, along the hallway, you see the central office, which has been sized to accommodate three staff members, has great visibility both into the ag equipment shop as well as the horticulture shop, as well as the hallway across. And so this was the one location that didn't give quite as good visibility into the classrooms because it's difficult to find a spot where you can have 360 degree access to all spaces within the building. But um, this really offered, I think, the most advantages um, is what we heard back. So that's why we proceeded. Um, and so the Ag Equipment Shop, um, we're currently showing three bays. Again, we're going to talk a little bit more about what equipment's going to go in there and what type of access is needed, uh, the exact dimension of what's going to go on in there in terms of equipment being pulled in, um, and we're showing a storage room there. So that sort of rounds out the, the program um, and sort of the configuration of things. Um, and then, if I can move the slide forward. So this option 4B.2. Um, has reduced the footprint again. You go to the bottom right hand corner down to 9764, which is 100 square feet over where we were at the feasibility study, but it's really within that same order of magnitude where we were. So this is this is something that we feel confident in saying, okay, this, this at least it can work in the overall footprint uh, that was previously understood. This is a lot simpler as a structure uh, in terms of plan geometry layout, and so we think that there'll be some cost efficiency, cost efficiencies that will prove themselves out when we get to estimate. Um, really what we did here um, was actually take the north wall and the south wall and push them in each uh, by three feet to get that uh, size reduction. Um, if I flip back and forth, um, you might be able to notice like up in the classrooms, there's a little bit more elbow room between the tables and desks, um, and that is uh, something that is uh, conceded uh, when we try to pull that additional square footage out of the classrooms. Um, they're a bit below the 800 square foot that was in the program, but that's that's what happens as we try to make things smaller. We do think it still works. Um, it's, it's probably not too different from a lot of the classroom sizes that um, everyone is experiencing right now. Um, and so that's it's just something to be aware of in terms of how the efficiency is found. And likewise, um, along the shops and the head house, the southern wall being pushed up has pinched the shops a little bit. And so some of the work that we need to do moving forward is to look at some of the critical pieces that do want to get stored in say the ag equipment shop and make sure that there's enough depth on those bays to get something inside and keep it stored overnight. And we heard that the trailer that you guys use is um, one of the items that may be in there overnight. So that's something we're going to get some dimensions on. To clarify something you said, mm -hmm. this is less square footage, but you're also implying it's going to cost less per square foot as well. Less per square foot as compared to the feasibility study plan layout, the one that was sort of kinked and angled, uh, just because there's more repetition to the structure here. It's a simpler sort of footprint. It's essentially a large rectangle in terms of what it is. The CLT um, does have a slight premium probably above the steel. It's really not it's something we can talk about. I'm sure that you have a, <laughs> some uh, knowledge there. Uh, but. From an overall geometry standpoint, this should be a, probably a more cost effective. Uh, and again, we're going to prove that out as we get to the estimating. The estimators will tell us that. Okay, I'm just concerned that we we're like, here's this great thing, but now we're going to give it all these haircuts, and now it's not quite such a great thing anymore. So what we're trying to do is get back to the point where we still think it's a great thing, but it's at the same sort of gross square footage. Um, okay. Just looking at that particular metric of where we're going. Okay, and so. Can you clarify, does this have the internal climbing structure? Because that was a marquee, pretty exciting, very different thing. Yes, no, it, it does. It does have the interior climbing structure. I think what we've talked about is the fact that because it was a skills grant that's already been awarded to the school, um, and that it doesn't have to actually be used um, per the grant award, I think, until June of 2025. Um, we have the option of still thinking about it in the building, and we're still going to run that out. We think it's an exciting piece as well, and it would be wonderful to incorporate here. 
But again, we're going to get to a certain point where we have an overall number in front of us, and then we're probably all going to have to make some difficult choices about what is included in the project or not. So we want to be thinking about it in a, in a flexible manner that has options. Right. Okay. If I can, just as a follow-up, even after our meeting this morning, if I can show the principle about the climbing structure specifically. And, you know, as a, an alternative, having it up at the, uh, the forest, you know, in that, in that building. But then that would, it introduces a couple issues. One, that building potentially then becomes a, a learning environment, <coughs> and that introduces other issues with the Department of Ed that we talked about from the previous work. Uh, and then second of all, back to the design, uh, thank you, Helen, for pointing out uh, to Jonathan, I'm not sure if you saw, so that the first shot, one, right in the middle of the upper left-hand corner of the shop, that's where the climbing structure is right now. So from the design perspective, if we said we can't afford the climbing structures to get the building, so get rid of it, how do we get rid of the space? Like, um, right. How do so you repurpose the space? Yeah. It, exactly. So I, I don't think we could really shrink the building to save on the climbing structure. How do you make that work? So, um, so I think at the end of the day, it probably will stay in the building. I, I hope so. It, it's one of the exciting features, and, and if you take the candles off a birthday cake, it's just a cake. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's a great point, and, and I think that's part of my feedback back to SMMA. Going from the first designs a few slides ago to this particular slide, from the outside of looking in, it looks like the same design. But it's 2,000 square feet, almost smaller. So that how you were able to shrink it without really changing the, the fundamental design, I think, is noteworthy. There's a couple other points I just want to really reinforce the feedback from what we saw back in June, and, I, and really the feedback that the two instructors provided and all the students provided, and uh, uh, Kevin Brown, our director of security, he was part of the meeting. Uh, one example would be all the classrooms now will have doors so you can access classroom A to B to C, and that was from Kevin Brown's perspective as far as a potential crisis and we have to move students from point A to point B. Uh, that initial design that you saw back in June didn't have doors adjoining all the classrooms. Uh, another one, I think the feedback that the instructors provided uh, was back to supervision and line of sight. Was there a way to line up the doors, as an example, between the shops and the classrooms? Uh, that initial design, they weren't lined up. So it would be difficult uh, if James was in the classroom to see students in the shop or vice versa. Now you can kind of see uh, the sort of truncated, those first two classrooms Working left to right, those doors are kind of lined up, line of sight uh, with that main shop, and, and the same thing with the singular classroom and, and the, the smaller classroom on the right. So that feedback, I think, was noteworthy. Uh, so I, I do appreciate that. Uh, but I agree with you. How small can we go, yep. and then we lose? Sure. Uh, and, and I assume that the the equipment doors are still standard size to accommodate the vehicles that use them. Right. And it's part of the confirmation as well. We need to make sure that we understand everything that wants to go in there yep. and make sure that what we have is wide enough, even if it is maybe atypical for a Once upon a time, I went to the Amherst Regional Junior High School, which was in antiquity, and exactly the same building. Um, but my seventh grade classroom had a uh, like an accordion wall with the other seventh grade classroom. Has there been any design discussion about having the common wall between the two classrooms be something like that so it can accordion out? to have a meeting space, a bigger meeting space for industry groups, for, for sort of a, a merged classroom day, just, just as an idea. I, I don't know if that changes the fire code or functionality, it, just as a, a, a thought. I, I don't know if, if those things are a nightmare for, for maintenance. Take on that. As far as the teaching and learning, we do have a, a few classrooms on campus that have a, the accordion and mm -hmm. the running wall, and nobody's happy with their Okay. <laughs> so we have fair. teachers asking them, like, can you just take it out, or can we put a concrete wall up? Okay. Uh, it's just from the sound barrier perspective. Then that's excellent. Yeah, fine. Are there any other uh, schools in, in either the New England state or New York state that might have facilities like this that uh, we could visit or take a look at or ask them if there's any different changes or what their sizes might be based on the student precipitation? Uh, uh, students that are uh, participating in the class. I know there are other horticulture programs. In terms of the exact sort of standalone building, I don't think there are too many that follow this exact model, but 
uh, we could certainly get you a list of other horticulture programs. Um, I think it's be hard because those are programs as a, like a, a half day program or part of a you know, megalith building. But this is such a, a unique and remarkable institution. Mm -hmm. I think it would be hard to find something similar. It would be more like a university research outpost like the Cranberry Station or the Turf Station. If, so, if somebody else has already already gone through it though, it's always good to yeah, take care of that to see if they're uh, if we, if somehow we could improve on it. The square footage of those classrooms as presented compared to what we took that way. Okay. <laughs> Tim, the, the square footage of the current classrooms that we had in the horticulture room yep. and the other classrooms on campus, how do they compare with the square footage <coughs> what, What's the number? So these are about 730, 750. Yeah, that that's about average. So surely there's a state minimum and that's more than that. Yeah. Okay. So to, to add to that, how does the rest of kind of the different spaces compare to the, the building currently? The existing building? Yeah. It's a great question. Um, so I think one of our, again, our next steps sort of moving forward is to get a better survey of that existing building so okay. that we can both draw demolition drawings, uh, documentation estimating purposes. Uh, but also to answer that exact question, okay. just to give you sort of a line by line as to how it compares to the existing. I think you'll find in most cases it's probably going to be larger. Yeah. Um, you guys are doing a lot with the existing remnants of the building that were there, and I think previously prior to the fire as well. I mean, there's a lot of activity in a very compact footprint. Okay. I'm, I'm also seeing the, the greenhouse as being sort of a box. Uh, greenhouses come in lots of different styles. Smith College has about the fanciest one you could possibly imagine, and then there's sort of inflatable ones that are clearly single use. Yes. Do, do you have a sense of what is going to be proposed? Because that changes the, the bottom line quite a bit. It, it does and it can, certainly. Um, so the greenhouse footprint that we're showing there matches the existing greenhouse footprint. And that's really to give us, again, flexibility in terms of how we're thinking about the cost estimating. Um, I think it was previously even considered of the potential of relocating that existing greenhouse, not the, the base walls, but at least the superstructure yep. um, that's there and putting it down again. So this this would actually allow that to happen. Um, there's certainly some other scenarios we could build new on top of that same footprint. We could consider a more compact footprint with a different type of geometry as well. And it, it, it's almost like it's its own uh, path of investigation to sort of flesh out all of those particular issues okay. as well. And so we're going to be working with Mark and James to figure out exactly what the needs are there. We're going to be discussing probably directly with some greenhouse manufacturers to understand sort of where the capabilities are and where the cost models are again, because you're exactly right. There's a huge range of what that could end up representing. And it's not, nor has it ever been included in the overall gross square footage number, um, because it's just a different type of square footage. You're not paying for concrete slabs and roofs and everything. It's, it's a house known to an airlock. There could be an airlock installed. The, the greenhouse is measured with warmer and damper than the building needs to be. Mm -hmm. right. A double dooring would be virtuous. Anything hydroponic in that, or just so I think it, what we've heard is that the intent is to maintain a similar functionality to what's there, and so the hydroponics are all done in the greenhouse that's attached to the structure right now, and all the, the dirt work is um, done in the, in the standalone hoop house that's down uh, down the hill. And Cornell University's got a fabulous. Uh, a facility, hydroponics, that they do over there. We're, we're certainly interested to hear any, any resources, contacts that are out there um, to work with in terms of getting to the right, the right uh, functionality and the right scope of work as well. I think that's those two things that we have to get in alignment. Is the idea to move the fuel bunker uh, conics box over nearby? So we certainly discussed the fuel bunker and then sort of the realities of it. I don't know that we have a, a final resolution on that yet. Okay. Um, so that's not part of this building? Not attached to this building, no. We're not, yep. not seeing that. There was a request from the students to install and create a gas station as part of our construction, but we politely declined that. It's Very good idea. the uh, EV plug. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and so this is, I won't dwell on this uh, just because it's tough to read numbers up on the screen. Um, we have a, what we call a space summary which sort of breaks down all of the square footages for the building um, in tabular form. This is intended to be a little bit more uh, digestible just because it breaks out the individual uh, program elements. 
um, and it shows for comparison purpose here. These are the both the original feasibility study adjacency diagrams. So that was back when the building was uh, considerably larger at 17,000 square feet, um, as well as the feasibility study program uh, for the plan uh, that was arrived at at 9648. Um, then gone ahead and. The head house did change in size. So right, you're, you're now sticking with the current greenhouse. So the greenhouse you see is not listed on here. Um, so again, it's not because it's not net square footage in terms of what we're building. Um, I think it's it's intended to be consistent. Okay. I don't think I see the greenhouse on here. Was I missing the head house? The head house. The head house. It's not. It's the. Yeah. It's the interior it's space. The interior space. Right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, right, so originally it was 1,600 square foot space, um, it went down to 1,000. Um, the 4B.1 option, it had grown back up to 1,100, but again, we pulled it back to 1,000 just to try to match um, both overall square footage as well as sort of where things were. So um, I think everyone will have access to the slideshow after, so you have the ability to sort of scrutinize the numbers if, if so inclined. All right, that's the exciting part. <laughs> Um, as we were talking about where to place this building on site, um, we thought it'd be good to step back a little bit and squint our eyes. And we can think about the site as really being two terraces. There's an upper terrace um, that's the level of build in the other buildings near the old, old greenhouse horticulture building. And then there's a the lower terrace where the animal science building is, the tennis courts are, the equipment handling. And then on site, we have two roadways that make that connection on grade. Uh, so as we think about where to site, site the building, we're either thinking about high, middle, or low, and trying to think about balancing access and accessibility, ADA access, and then also balancing cut and fill on, on site. Um, we'll talk you through a bunch of options. So we've been working both at more of this diagrammatic phase as well as in getting in-depth with the detailed grading. So the first option is more akin to what you saw originally in the, in the original proposal, where we're um, pushing the building up as close as we can to the athletic field. Um, we're providing an area for the focal point that could or could not have the greenhouse remaining in it. But we have now a vehicular area and a new uh, court for the southern end of campus. Um, we're using we're using the existing service drive to the south of the building and then rising back up the service area um, behind the building. So this, in this option, the greenhouse um, moves to the south, and we have some parking up near the upper terrace level. So this option, the, the building is up high at 229, um, and then would require probably the most amount of build for the, for the options for considering. Um, and it, one of the questions, too, came up was about the meta sequoia tree. We're waiting on survey information about where that is exactly and if it could be saved in this option. This option also anticipates a bioretention stormwater area to the south of the building um, that we're definitely going to need. We're going to need to talk about stormwater site um, at the end of this. And then another question in all of these options is what the elevation the grades are around the existing buildings. We want to make sure that we're not pushing water and soil up against the existing buildings and that we're grading and maintaining access for those. So this is all based upon the GIS information, and once the survey is available, we'll definitely be refining this option. Um, and this is more getting into the, into the details of that. So um, as you can see, there's quite a bit of a drop for the bioretention area from that service area, service, um, service pad, and then the drops down um, between the building and the animal sciences. And we're making up the grades along the drive on the north part of that focal point, and then again um, between the Moot Hotel and the new building. Um, so we'll have steeper areas of drive and then more shallow areas of drive. And this option, um, we anticipate fire department access on the west side of the building and possibly on the service drive with crossing the bio retention area. We'll be talking with the fire department if, they, if they're okay with that. It may be a little bit more challenging getting trucks up into the service area by. Isn't it going to shed water on that hillside to the north side of the building now? Um, in this option, the building is up, up high. It's about four feet lower than the athletic field. Um, 
so there'd be a swale between it and the other cut off swale between the to to, uh, to take the water from the field around. It's not sure. Yeah. So these are these are really really uh, really rough kind of massing of grading to see how things fit on the site. Um, we'll be refining this more once we get more detailed. Rather than having the swale and waste that land, is there some way you put drainage in there and so you can the land still be usable? Um, you could put a, a French drain that would have a lower profile to try to grab it with a pipe, uh, and, and yeah. a pipe to it. To so, so that you're not going to use the off. use of the land because the land is becoming very precious here. Right. It, we're not ta we're talking about a very shallow swale, and yeah. it probably be, would be a good idea to yeah. put a French drain yeah. in the full one. that option was more of the developing the high, that upper terrace area. This option is looking at the lower terrace area developing that. So we've moved, moved the building down and further to the east, closer to the animal science area, um, closer to those lower points on the service drive. And what, what that um, does enable us to do is to provide a more significant swell between the sports field and the building. Um, it's still We'll be able to have an accessible walkway to the front of the building, which will be on the west face. We have really good visibility of that frontage from the academic buildings and other buildings on the sort of to the west of, of the site. It allows us to buy it, to bring water also around the west side of the building. Um, and then more more flexibility with vehicular access in and out of the building on the south side. And also in the winter conditions, having that on the south side that's good for melting snow and ice. Through, through solar so the current road goes like right here, There's right through there. the building. Yeah. And this this is where the conics boxes are here. This is sort of the yeah. back dirt road. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And and this one, you know, like all, I think all of them, the existing greenhouse staying and going is is an option. Um, and this one, the fire department access would be to the west face and the south face. Um, no question there. Um, and so this one, this one would be less. Would definitely be. We think would be less for the site. Those are again. This is the maximum degree, just the significance of that of that swale. And, and, Because here there's a more so, severe grade change between the right. field and the building. Yeah, yeah eight, eight feet or so for finish four. Um, so. Mm -hmm. yeah. so this is showing the building kind of down like in a depression? Yeah, right? it's, yeah, it's so the down. parking lot that you have is about 220, 221, 222. Okay. So yeah. it would still be a little higher than the parking lot. Okay. But much lower than the elevation of the This one is very similar to what you just saw, similar elevation, similar cut fill. Um, and, but in this one, we're introducing uh, a little bit of another rain garden stormwater feature, linear feature between that and the service drive. Um, in addition, we this works with the uh, map describe or rotating the greenhouse um, in a, the same alignment as the building and then moving the big parking spaces um, to the south side of the building. This one, from in terms of grading, what we were starting to see is that this could be more more challenging, and that um, the greenhouse and the building would sort of act as a dam for any of that any of that water coming down. So, just, uh, yeah, that's not ideal at all <laughs> <laughs> because the, your the low point is right near your entrance um, yeah. because it sort of is it the the, the junction of the terrace uh, drop. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, so so uh, that would not be recommended because you'd be relying on a pipe to get the water out of that there. And it's better not to rely on a right. pipe. Um, and this one, the as we were also thinking about um, the metasequoia tree, which we think may be where that tree is shown, um, trying to think of how to shrink the width of the building with the south, see if we can 
save that tree if you needed to. Um, and so in this option, we looked at what happens if we flip the service yard to the north side um, and kind of allow the site to fall quickly down to the meta sequoia if, it's, if that's where it is. Um, some of the drawbacks of this were that, again, um, paved areas would be possibly on the north side, which would maybe more challenging to manage in icy conditions. Um, it would require a retaining wall, which could hide the service yard from the field, but also um, kind of separates the, the bays from other parts of campus and is expensive. Um, and then the front entry could be a little confusing because um, you'd be walking around the building differently from the north or the north and west um, to get to the new entry. And then um, we're anticipating, this is one of the, the 228 elevation, finished floor elevation is high enough that you know down to 219, 220 at the south east corner, you, we may be able to have a basement storage or other storage underneath that would be a But again, that would be a lot of exposed foundation wall um, without usable access along the side. And then this is another version of that, uh, looking at moving the greenhouse to the south east corner and having the parking on that side, an entry point there. Um, creating kind of a node for the animal science building and the artificial building, but many of the same challenges are with where the country is and where our students came from. I think some of the sort of challenges that are not necessarily shown with these options, uh, and sort of flipping things in terms of what we have previously shown, is that some of the interior relationship between spaces and the main entrance. All those things are going to get tossed up in the air a bit, and we'd have to sort those out. Not to say that they're impossible to rework, um, but we don't know yet because we haven't gone through that sort of full um, exploratory process. If it was something that this was of interest, um, we'd go down that road, but we want to make sure that there's enough other benefits that would warrant that investigation. Mm -hmm. so this is the summary of the thoughts that we In addition, I also wanted to talk a little bit about the stormwater as we think about these options. Northampton has just uh, changed their stormwater regulations. So for, this would be our second, the second project, second project in, in the city that would be subject to these regulations. Um, they're a little bit more strict in terms of developable you know, project footprint. And you want to talk about it a little bit? Sure. I mean, there's basically two components: the water quality component and the, the quantity, the, de the detention required. So water quality has become much stricter. We're, we're dealing not just with uh, total suspended solids, but with uh, nitrogen and phosphorus removal. And the best way to do that is infiltration. Um, but they're requiring that we infiltrate uh, eight-tenths of an inch over all of the impervious area, not just the new impervious area, because this is technically a redevelopment. Um, and so we're going to have to do quite a bit of uh, water quality. And um, if the soils are not good or the, um, or the uh, estimated high groundwater is, is high, um, we would have to do that with uh, hydrodynamic separators and maybe other filters for this phosphorus and nitrogen. So we would hope to be able to do this with rain gardens and. Uh, detention areas that can also infiltrate. Um, under the water quantity uh, component, they've changed the storm such that uh, there are much higher uh, rainfall uh, numbers. For example, the 100-year storm is, um, I think it's around 11 inches now, where we were using 7 or 8 inches. Um, so that makes a big difference over, especially in purpose areas, for runoff. So we will be looking at detention here because we the detention the the quantity is only on the <coughs> additional impervious area, but there will be I would say maybe close to <coughs> twenty thousand square feet of new impervious area here, which translates probably to about five thousand cubic feet of required storage, which is slowly let out. So that's going to have to go somewhere. Um, and possibly under the service area and some of these options. And, and then we would hope that the water table is low enough that we can 
uh, allow some to infiltrate when we have that two feet of separation. Are, are so, you counting pavement in your total impervious area? Yes. Okay, can we use permeable pavement to help with that? And if we're talking about fill and we're worried about water table, well, let's just find some sandy fill. Oh yeah, the fill would, would, does somewhat solve the problem. So, um, so it causes a cost, but it solves the problem. It could solve, it could solve the problem. If there is a problem, we might dig a hole in it, like what we see. <laughs> uh, uh, but we are on the lower terrace, which, sure. which gets... Uh, if we're creating an awful lot of fill, aren't we sort of presenting ourselves with essentially the opportunity to create a gigantic leach field? Yeah, we can, we, if the service area were high, we could, we could put all these under the yes. Uh, por porous pavement, um, I think we heard this morning that, that there's a, a liking for a gravel uh, due to the equipment ripping okay. it up. Even better, yeah, yeah, even better. Any test boring, is that, when is that going to happen? Those, <coughs> yes, those services would need to be contracted. Okay. Yeah. So that's going to tell you a lot about what the soil are. Out there. I mean, don't they have backhoe here? Can't we just dig all? <laughs> yeah, so, well, that so was they, a question. These would be <laughs> test pits for uh, for stormwater, and so we need to go to eight feet, and it, we and then we we uh, we look at the pit and we. It's a big backhoe. Yeah, I. <laughs> I'm coming to get James. <laughs> I'm a soil evaluator. You dig the hole, I'll log it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So at this morning's meeting, a few of us had some feedback. We sort of liked the concept around A1. Uh, so you can sort of see that, that focal point, I call it a roundabout rotary here in New England. Uh, and then you move it down back to that back axis for adjustment that you are referring to. Uh, we were talking about sort of road type. And I think the feedback that James and Mark gave back in June was really from coming down that back access road to the service area, the animal science area, if we could avoid pavement altogether, that would be ideal. Mostly because of the, the bulldozer with the metal, the metal tracks, you just tear up the pavement. So uh, I think that's a benefit for this particular discussion. But, uh, but again, at the opening, I said I'd love to have any input from, from the rest of you. But, you know, the smaller group, we sort of like the idea of A1. Um, I do too. I do too. I, 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 I was thinking the same one. I, I'm proud of our industry, and I don't like the idea of let's put it in a hole. <laughs> the flow of traffic is very important yep. to keep it moving rather than it's a dead end. Mm -hmm. Well, we're growing more than in fact. Yeah. Yeah, in, indeed. And I, and, you know, I liked your idea of that that's, there's a, a roundabout rotary, and it could be a collection area where there's teachable space or you know, just a gathering spot. And I, I feel like we, we're starting to see that, you know, metastasize throughout the other options. I mean, just to be clear, so A1, there is a difference between A and A1. Mm -hmm. So A1 is more of that, that in the hole, okay? Uh, oh, then I like A better than A1. A <laughs> yeah, I like A it, I like it up. But, my understanding with A is a lot more fill involved, yep. correct. 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 which yeah. has and some potential benefit. And A but is in the on. field also. You notice the the um, uh, what is it? The little booth. The, the press, press box. box. Yes, the press box. Yeah. Um, a is is in line with the press box, which may be a problem with the lights. So, mm -hmm. press box versus press box. Oh. I kind of like the idea of having the building somewhat offset from the field, not having it just kind of so tucked and kind of jammed up in that corner. And then the, the service here too on A1, I like that a bit more than A because it's kind of, it's not as isolated. You kind of, you kind of get access to it because we, we do campus maintenance. So it's like, they have to bring a mower all the way out of the service here on A all the way around and back out. Whereas you can kind of cut that in half as well as access to the task force and everything else. Kind of important, but I know bringing it up would kind of have trouble with that service here. But I feel like if it is set down, you're gonna have a great view of the roof from the field. From the field, mm -hmm. yeah. yep. It's gonna be. Isn't there something down there? I don't know. <coughs> just like, and if it's a, a green roof, it's like just more field. Or if it's asphalt or a membrane, it's just a great view of the roof. And it, I, I was hoping this could be a marquee that it's a. A focal point to new shiny building. Let's let's show off our new car. Well, neither 
I take that <coughs> point, but um, the field elevation was 233 or something. Right. Yeah. So, so <coughs> neither of them have the building sitting up, so its finished floor is even with the field. Okay. So one is low and one is lower. Okay. Just to keep it. Okay, thank you. Yeah, it wouldn't be feasible to have the finish fly the same way as the field. That would be, that would be a little <laughs> more foul. <laughs> I mean, it would, if, you, if you take a walk out back there, you can see it's quite a big elevation change just on that small And to be clear, there was floor. never an option to put parking underneath the building. You haven't looked at parking underneath. No, no, I mean, I'm sorry, the parking of the machinery. Um, I think in one of the options, that was a potential. Um, or in terms of what storage would go underneath there, but um, there would have some ability to have storage space underneath, but we would need to have it be high enough at access and really from that upper plateau, and then the, the bottom access is going to be from the, the lower plateau essentially coming in to get that mm -hmm. rate to have a chance of working out because it's about 10 foot difference mm -hmm. between the two, right? Yeah. And it's still not tremendous in terms of but, floor, floor. And right? that's a big monkey room, so change your design a lot. Right. Right. And the question too is about accessibility between those floors. Are mm -hmm. we in a situation where we're oh, sure. yeah. being on Yes. I think just in terms of the perception of the building, so some of the next steps that we'll come back to, like we did for the interview, we, we start modeling these things and letting everyone be able to visualize both building and site together. Mm -hmm. um, so I think certainly we can provide some view points from the field so that we can really get a sense of whether or not it feels mm -hmm. sunken. And I don't think it will be. I think the building is going to be tall enough. We were just chatting. I don't think we have that exact number for you right off the top of our heads right now. But um, we'll be able to show you in terms of what the, okay. the look and feel will be. To, it can be a level of comfort with it. I, and I'm not necessarily advocating for this, but if you tuck the equipment parking underneath, it has some drawbacks. Perhaps you need an elevator and have less visibility. but. It's less roof and less foundation, so there's cost. The second floor is always cheaper than the first floor. So how how low is A one? Is that kind of with the existing grade down there right now on that that road, or is it still going to be brought up a bit? The 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 low <coughs> point on the road is two twenty, and yeah. that building is at two twenty five. Okay. So the thought was that we would actually raise the road uh, uh, a bit. Yeah. And, and then. Because the 220 wraps around, at least on GIS, yeah. the 220 wraps around the road, so we and then and then the road actually rises a little before it heads down to yeah. the road. So we would raise the road maybe to 223, and then the building's at 225, and the field's at 233. And what what is the grade for A, not A1? Like what's what's the delta between the two? A, I think the building is at 229, and the reason for that is it basically is a 4.5% uh, slope for the pedestrian way to the entrance to the building. So it's four feet different. It's four feet okay. below the field, yep. And then it's four, quite four feet steep. higher. Uh, yes, than the other one. Is there a way that A1 could kind of, if you bring up that road a little bit more, almost as a compromise, kind of not Something having it in down the in a hole, you kind of bring A1 up and that. Something in the middle. Mm -hmm. Just kind of in terms of drainage and everything, too. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's balancing the cost and fill equation, right? I think both of those things will come into play, and the fill may be helping us, yeah. um, but it'll come at a cost, and so it's, again, what is, what is manageable um, budget? balancing all desires. Another reference point, where is the animal science building? Do we know the other channel? We're thinking it's 227. Okay. Based on GIS, but it could be. The GIS does odd things around buildings. <laughs> <laughs> Little mountains. It's 227. A1 is 225 for the horticulture building. Mm -hmm. So a couple of feet. So yeah, there's another reference point to Looking right out here, right across <laughs> the field, I mean, you can see <laughs> the, the top of the foundation of that building is peeking out there, so. Yeah. Other comments, feedback, questions? Well, is there any reason at this point, so my daughter's looking at colleges, and what I want to hear from her is which colleges she doesn't like. That's more important than the one she does. So you can drop stuff off the list. 
Are, are we, <laughs> how should we go forward? Just like systematically, should we strike some? Or do we want to keep all the balls in the air and then realize some of them are never going to be favored? Like, what, what's the best approach? Yeah, the bees <coughs> jump out at me when you ask that. Is there any advantage to having the, the parking and the access on the field side? It seems more difficult. There's more disadvantages, I think, to be, because like I was saying with the access to the tennis courts, to be able to bring a piece of machinery from the service here all the way around that loop and all the way back down, especially in terms of, I don't know, just because it, it, it's such a short distance, it'd be easy to just be able to shoot right out there to the tennis court and not have to go all the way around and kind of save the life of our rubber tires and tracks as well. So. A2 has that sort of <coughs> island of green that like, that's two roads next to each other. Why, why mm -hmm. do that? Stormwater, um, water quality, because the apron, the service apron would, would sheet flow into that green island um, and get some treatment. Um, also ran a fire truck, a pumper truck, not a ladder, around and it makes it around that it can be down A2, yeah, and it can go like that. Probably could do that, or maybe not. But it is a nice way to deal with stormwater, with sheet flow. You're saying as that island could almost be, like, whether it be just, like, kind of there, or would it be almost a depression that, be a depression. okay, that water would run into? Okay. Mm -hmm. not, not very deep, maybe a foot deep. Oh, okay. Six inches of ponding. Yeah. It would have growth in it, right? Rain yeah. garden, bio yeah. soil. Again, all dependent on soil. But we can do a filter in the rain garden too. I guess the B options seem to me to require two ways down. They seem to be kind of doubling, doubling effort there. Mm -hmm. More pavements. Um, yeah. Retaining a lot of requirements. So yeah. I would eliminate that in life. I'm yeah. not seeing an advantage in this. That this almost system. wouldn't look right either if we, like we're saying, like say we bring in stone or some sort of gravel fill there in the service here, that wouldn't make sense just have it dead mm -hmm. end right there, black top to the, mm -hmm. and it wouldn't look necessarily pleasing to the eye if you're mm -hmm. standing from this level here looking over there. You just kind of see that difference. I don't think, I, I like the roundabout. I like, I like that yeah. it becomes a hub. Instead of like, oh yeah, the portal down the end of the road. Right. Um, could this, if this is a retention area, couldn't that same retention be right there? Yes, definitely. So we discussed that this morning. There's one of the questions mm -hmm. because Jonathan, right where you pointed on a one, that we're getting close to the drop off, that access road that we have down to the orchard, you know, down the bottom of the orchard road there is a, a brook. So. Uh, that was sort of the discussion this morning. Could that become the catchment area for the storm water? And maybe both of them on any one. I mean, two linear features. The more, <laughs> the more the better. <laughs> With the new storm water regs. Yeah, I mean, that James. You mean bus? Well, to be honest, it's a little hard to see because it's small, but um, <laughs> ones where the access is on the south side of the building. Yeah. It works better, to be honest, whether the building's higher or lower. Mm -hmm. um, it's kind of irrelevant to the usability of it. Mm -hmm. And just for the team, so Will Coffee is the city procurement officer. Uh, he's also on the building committee, so welcome. Thank you, Eddie. Nice to meet you all. Um, yeah, Will Coffee here to assist for any procurement needs in regard to compliance with mass Massachusetts procurement law. So, um, just listening in, this is fascinating. Happy to be here. I like the idea to echo what James has said that if there's parking to the south, you're going to be looking at if, if we solarize the roof, it's a bit of a bragging point. But if the solar is all hidden in the back, it's just sort of like, oh yeah, around back where the mullet is, that's where all the good happens. <laughs> Yeah, to answer your question, the one on the top row in the middle that has like a bigger, more open parking area is, is easier mm -hmm. for students to use. Yeah. That's all I'll say. Mm -hmm. 
Would you would the service area itself in front of the doors be gravel yes, as well? Yes. Okay. 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 Sorry. I I would recommend <clears throat> I think most of this has to be probably paid is currently pavement. Yes. Um, but once we get down to like this intersection, yeah. all back, I don't think it has to be pavement. Mm -hmm. It would be a lot cheaper to have the arcade in that whole spot there. That's just all gravel. <clears throat> the one thing we might want to do though is just make sure that the fire department would also be on board with that concept in terms of making sure they can get their apparatus down there. True. What is the the, the difference between here and finished floor? Do you have a sense of that? Just, I'm asking because it, it's going to impact, you know, right now we just have the, Sorry, we're just going to go one? back A2? to the larger. That was A1. 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 Okay, so this is A1, so we've got an FFP of, Oops, yeah. oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> of 225. <laughs> okay, that works nicely. Yeah, if that's true, that works nicely. I'm just, it's, there's a good bit of slope here. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. yeah. Great. And then, yeah, that's an argument for 225 because it would make the entrance pretty smooth. Mm. It also work in terms of plowing and stuff too, if it is kind of slope and kind of melting snow and water runoff, if it all, not necessarily you want it to run into the gravel and kind of wash it out, but in terms of it kind of slopes off to that area, and if you did have some sort of retention spot that it would flow into, down in that, in that lower area over here, so it would run off there as well as down there into mm -hmm. kind of that spot yeah. as well. And possibly there's a this might also help, but there's a, there's a swale here, here, between these two buildings. Yeah. And so we're going to have to deal, so right now we have like a 4.5% slope to, to stop to be 5%, to be, uh, to, into the building for ADA. Mm -hmm. So we do have kind of a grading in this direction, but we, we could swale that possibly and somehow maybe tie this part of the building into here. So we have several outlets to mimic existing conditions. Um, and then this this has the the roundabout has. Uh, can you go to that to the screen? I think the roundabout has. Maybe. Which one? The one the next slide I think. We just go stand there. Or maybe I should have it. Oh, yeah. 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 Yeah, so the roundabout has a sort of a sheet flow aspect to it right now. I don't know how that would work with the greenhouse. Mm -hmm. But you can see the swale here. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, just a thought. And we really haven't gotten into the detailed design of what the focal point would be. I think there's still a lot of opportunities there. Um, we talked about a learning um, environment that could happen there, outdoor classroom space. It could be a good tree planting location. It, it's a lot of thought and discussion that we can have about what that could be, but I think it, it has opportunities also in terms of potential for drainage and stormwater management. It was interesting, uh, back to the um, thing about the students, I think the students were the, by far the, the best stakeholders that we had with feedback. And uh, they immediately looked at that focal point, and the original design that this committee saw, uh, there was that beautiful artistic climbing structure uh, that was in that focal point. They said, absolutely not. There's a waste of time, waste of space. Uh, they want to be climbing outside, but if they're outside, mm -hmm. give, give me a tree. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to have it inside is if it's conditions yeah. like this, you can be climbing inside. That's worthwhile. Yeah. 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 Let me ask you this. The, the roof of this building is going to be pretty large in square footage, and there's going to be a lot of rain runoff. Yeah. Right? Is that water, can that be collected and then used somewhere else? rather than just use it as a runoff and then worry about retention ponds and things like that? Could it be used in the greenhouse or somewhere else? Right, so I think there is a plan for a cistern. And, and so 
that's a, net, a positive thing. The problem right. with the regulations are that with, you can't count on a sister to always be empty mm -hmm. the next time it rains. Right. And so it really, it's a nice thing that you, you could say in the stormwater report, the city will like that. Mm -hmm. It can't be like, we're taking care of this volume because it's going into that cistern. Because yeah. it might be full because of the crazy weather we don't. <laughs> Lately. So so if this is A one, just to be crisp, we're we're still talking about shortening the building. It, the current floor of the former building is at two thirty one ish, right? And we're talking about scooching it down to two twenty five. So it will be lower. Correct. That's what A1 does. Is it, it scooches it, it down by it six, seven down feet. Because then it has this it's sort of, it basically the yep. idea was it links it that, to that room. Correct. But that's the put it in a hole thing. It does. Yep. Um, to add to the, the cistern part, that in terms of getting rid of that water, it's already filled up. I don't know if there's some sort of deal that you can make with the fire, or with the fire department. I know I live in West Hampton. I know they have uh, on top of Hampshire Regional, they have the fire department in town. They take water for their, their tank or whatever, for their pump truck. They use that. Um, when it fills up, they'll pump it out and stuff. So I don't know if there's some sort of deal that you can make with that, or if there's some sort of kind of backup system where they use that water if we have it readily available and fill it up. You can sell it for those swimming pools around right there. <laughs> you need to account for 11 inch storm. That's exactly. the that's the hundred year. But that's event. what you need to be able to. Well, dissipate. we need to make the hundred year event, the uh, uh, the peak flow from the hundred year event, be less than the existing flow. So we we model, model. Mm -hmm. and and so um, so of course, and in existing existing conditions, we'll also use eleven inches, but there's will be less impervious area. So so the rule of thumb, it, we do like a rule of thumb to establish what we think we might need to store, and it, it looks like. Four or five thousand cubic, and then we let it out slowly through. Uh, How many cubic feet are in a residential system? Uh, what are they? Uh, I don't. I'm, I'm not sure that we're actually thinking about a residential system. I'm just talking about larger ones. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I don't have that. Is it a sister so, or an Olympic swimming pool that we need to be thinking oh, about think putting on the landscape? Yeah. Okay. So uh, a big sister might be. So okay, so half of that. So that's a thousand feet. Okay. Oh. Or so. Oh, we might need multiple. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. But uh, uh, so I, I think the cistern is a good idea. I don't know how that relates to phosphorus and nitrogen. If we decide to put it in the cistern and then dump it on the ground, uh, so um, cisterns anyway. is only it's more part of maybe an educational or a practical mm -hmm. use and not going to solve in any way, shape, or form the stormwater issue. Yeah. Yeah. I just, it's just yeah. for me. We need a farm of cisterns. Yeah, <laughs> yeah the, the surface area, I think, is approximately 5,000 square feet. That yeah, so for example, we could use the service area for underground storage. Um, about 5,000 square feet, so yeah. about a foot. We put in some chambers, depending on where the groundwater is, I mean, of course, we'd like to put in a deeper chamber, but uh, if we if we uh, if we have six feet before we find high groundwater, mm -hmm. then we can mm -hmm. put mm -hmm. the system under the surface. And those don't mind bulldozers driving on them. Oh, correct. That's the point. Yeah. And does that require some sort of almost sewage drain, or would it just be it just there, filtrates through the they either, ground? They either be those um, chambers that are arch chambers with yeah. stone in between. Okay. Or they would be uh, others are little boxes. Yeah. Okay. And it would be all that lined with storage under there, okay. and then it would have a an outlet structure um, where you see so you would control it with a small outlet mm -hmm. into a manhole, okay. and then then you would discharge it. So you make the parking lot into a leach. Yeah. Pretty much. Yeah. But but only only the bottom would reach out. The rest would go out. And so in that system, where would that water go out? Would you kind of daylight it out down the, the grade we'd, down there? We'd, we probably, somewhere in here with some kind of level spreader to spread it out so okay. that it can sheet flow down. Yeah. 
Because like, the only other concern is that road down to the outboard mm -hmm. to go there, there you wouldn't want there you get hammered enough with it does. the water and everything. Southern we, waterboards, yeah. Yeah, we we, <laughs> we we wouldn't want any mo any extra flow necessarily that way, but if it flows kind of yeah, further down, yeah, we would choose a place. That, if we go the that way, that, yeah, that would be alright. But we definitely yeah. choose that carefully. Probably quite a wide level spreader yeah. to get it to spread yeah. out. Okay. For today's meeting, I'd like to make an offer. How about we get rid of the B options so you guys can start focusing on maybe just the three options? Or do this committee want to get <coughs> excuse me rid of any of the other options? Well, it seems to me that all the A's are, they're all A's because they're similar. And I have the feeling that, that this team is going to kind of explore those. And, it seems to me that there might be kind of a compromise between A and A1. Uh, they have many similar elements. There, there's only a four foot difference between those two floor elevations. It's not like one sits up nice and tall and one is in the hole. Um, there's only a four foot difference. And, and in fact, I was, you know, if, if A1 were to go up a couple more feet, it might help us um, on that, I'm going to call it the street side where that parking is, so you could slope the water away uh, from the building a little bit um, and, and incorporate some of the good things about A and the good things about A1. That, that's my sense of where we're headed. If you're going to have the storage underneath, can't you lift that up higher? Yep. I mean, so so it all plays in. I think you're right. The, the, the extra lift may be needed. Yeah. Who knows? Right. Yeah. Right. Something. Out of respect for time, I so, sounds like the committee was sort of liking the, the A option for all these reasons. Uh, I recommend that we keep moving forward and, and allow you to keep playing with those A options. Uh, and, I, and I think again, at the end of the day, I think what I also heard, and I agree. And the whole cut and fill dilemma, um, it's probably going to boil down to the money, too. Is how much do we want to cut and how much do we want to fill? I know there's more, and I, I do want to talk about the donations. We, do have, we have an answer on if we're allowed to donations or not. So, <coughs> yeah, I think we can get through the uh, administrative stuff. Yes, yes, please. <laughs> Um, so I think we've heard a big caveat here today. Um, so Craig Wilbur, who's the OPM, who had a car failure today, he would be here, um, has secured the service of a, services of a surveyor. So I believe they'll be out on site next week, fingers crossed. Um, Berkshire Design Group has done a great job of working with, you know, sort of its GIS data. Um, so again, caveat, caveat, we need the actual data. Um, you've heard Lucy talk about a test pit, so we'll need to um, secure services for um, also geotechnical borings. It does look like we have a good sense of where the building's going to be, so now we can really scope out those services and solicit proposal. Um, so, and wetlands, I believe, have actually been um, flagged already. So, um, so we're working, chipping away at it. Um, and in terms of information from you all, um, the all equipment, um, survey data uh, survey, uh, I believe is underway right now. Craig is helping with that, um, as well as Tim. Um, I'm sure, we'll need some input from James and Mark, um, and we also do need that simulator info. I think you're working on getting us that to make sure we have that classroom sized appropriately. In terms of schedule, this is just a snapshot of the schematic design phase, which is what we're in right now. Um, you know, I, I did push out those site investigation states a little bit. Again, our, our goal is to buy, um, you know, early, late, late August, early September, be, be able to put something in front of our cost estimator. So obviously, all of that, um, you know, all of this exploration needs to be fed into what goes out to, to them. So we are still targeting, you know, having a good sense of where we are with SD by the end of September. That's it. And then, um, yep, we'll continue to work um, with the working group on a weekly basis. Um, and I understand that the next building committee meeting is the 15th of August. 
When will we start talking about systems and design elements? Is it going to be wood clad or is it going to be paint to concrete, metal roof? I think it's going to have to be the next meeting because yep. that has to but again, feed into the But well, once we figured out the sort of the footprint and yeah. the sort of internals, is that the next thing or is there another intermediary? Um, no, I think all of those things are really going to start to play in. You know, okay. our, our MEP engineers are going to start to jump on board, um, you know, and we'll definitely be continuing to develop the architecture and, this, and the systems. I think we feel good about the interior layout, actually, in terms of where it is now, which is a huge help in terms of the project development. So I think what we foresee at the next building committee meeting is similar to what we did today for floor plan in terms of site layout. We'll talk about systems and, and options that we have there as well as sort of exterior look and feel yeah. of what we'll be building with. Which is probably a good segue into donations. So if that was a question in the last building committee. You know, I want to thank Craig and, and Crystal looking into it. So the answer is we are allowed to receive donations uh, around um, supplies, equipment, heating elements, so on and so forth. So, I think once we get into the final design, design phase and we know exactly what we need, uh, we are able to then go out and ask for donations, which hopefully will then reduce the cost. So, uh, we've got those some figures. We can't uh, receive donations as far as labor, uh, but as far as building materials, uh, yes, we can. So, are those donations tax deductible? I assume they are. I would believe so. Yeah. You're asking me? Yes. Um, I would imagine. Yeah. I mean, if there's supplies and you could assign a monetary value, I would imagine, yeah. But I could, I could look and verify. Yeah. It's always helpful. Yeah. <laughs> I was looking and it says as long as you itemize. So there, there are some, hmm. I'm sure most, most itemized. And then it goes into um, the, adjust, the amount that you can deduct is based on the adjusted gross income. So there's definitely, I'm not an accountant, so. Sure. Anything else? Any other comments, questions? <clears throat> Not to confuse everyone, but to answer Mr. Roberts' question, the state of Connecticut and the state of Rhode Island have standalone ag buildings for their their uh, individual centers. So if you want, you don't have to go far down 91 to see an example of one. And they're staffed. Connecticut's are staffed all summer. If you want to see how they do, you know, standalone ag building of this similar square footage. But what's what, your thoughts on it? Well, I, I, I think we have a good idea here. Um, just you mentioned that earlier. Yeah. That, that was. So. But things that they have done that, that you think maybe we should be doing here. Well, <laughs> the other problem with that is they have a lot more money. <laughs> yeah. So some of the things right. they made we liked, but we have already taken some of those concepts out because we couldn't we couldn't afford them. Right, but as Andy said, you know, the donations might start to come in for yeah. some of this as well. Yeah, and there might be more money. Yep. So the students spend four years of their growth within this building, but the teachers spend a lot longer. Mm -hmm. I'm not convinced that the office is big enough. Mm -hmm. I think the office is a place where printing happens, where the most valuable uh, or expensive tools are kept. And frankly, it's, it's where teachers who go above and beyond spend long hours. Mm -hmm. And so I feel like that space should be looked at carefully. Yeah, since you mentioned the office, I also, you said that uh, um, a request was that it be uh, a spot that could look out over multiple classrooms the whole way. Uh, I know it, it can't look at every inch of the building, but right now I, I did feel like it was still mostly just looking at the uh, bottom right hand most classroom. It hadn't yet gotten that look and that might just be a quick chiropractic of moving the storage away from it but but I would agree that a little bit of attention to the office would be good. It's where private meetings happen, right? parent teacher conferences may happen there or any sort of counseling. Mm -hmm.
get really nice chairs <laughs> for the yeah. office. If the teacher likes their office, they like their job, and they do a good job. Get good chairs. Well, I think in order to keep moving here, folks, we've got to work with us, so we've got to go through with Andy with the donations. We're, we're trying to get you money to be able to do your job, and uh, <clears throat> if we can move that forward right now, I'd really appreciate your time. Thank you. Anything else? July 15th. 3 o'clock, same place. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.